perfect. So, um, so the way I thought I would do is I would give you first what are the business use cases that demands or recommends usage of Flink. Then we'll try to dissect the anatomy of Flink clusters and Flink table API. And I have uh, around 50 more minutes in my hand, so I'll try to finish the whole presentation in 30, 35 minutes. And then I have written two programs as a small demo. I would like to show you the demo and then take questions for the last uh, 10, 15 minutes. If you have any questions in between, what you could do is uh, you could just write it. Uh, would the chat be available to all users, uh, Arvind? Yeah, there is an icon called Q&A that is available for all. Perfect. And so uh, yeah, yeah, people can uh, ask uh, directly to yeah. the voice interface uh, that you can give a pause during the talk whenever you feel like. Sure. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll start uh, today's talk. Today's talk is stream processing using Flink and mostly using PyFlink and Flink table APIs. So Flink is written in Java, just like Spark is written in Java and Kafka is written in Java, Java and Scala both. Um, but then for development and for ease of use, I would demonstrate and I want to break down the non JVM aspects of Flink and I would focus on PyFlink and Flink table API today. I'm a developer advocate at Confluent. So with that, let's start. Um, so the whole premise of Flink comes into being because of uh, the use cases where customers and clients expect real-time services. So if you look at these uh, images, the first one is uh, some logistics, right? So where we have received some electronics and home appliances uh, and somebody is checking whether the home appliances are which has been received are right or not the second one is location services you're getting notifications based on your location or stuff like that and the third one is credit card transaction alerts and transaction notifications now remember these are all real times real time events that's happening with you it's almost at the same time you would whenever you swipe your card something happens right now, real-time services as the ones that I shown you would normally require a stream processing. So what is a stream? A stream is an unending supply of events, right? Now, what are those events? The events could be a sale, uh, a new sale, which is happening in a, let's say a, a retail store, a shipment, which has happened from the warehouse or the distribution center to the customer. Or it could be a trade which is happening on a stock trading platform. Or similarly, it could be a customer experience that, that's happening on, let's say, a flipkart.com or an amazon.in. And so these are the sources. And then there would be syncs, right? So there could be some front end where somebody sees that, okay, there has been five shipments in the last 15 minutes, or there have been 16 cart checkouts in the last two minutes, or something of that end. And then there would be backend operations, which is normally done through batch processing techniques, which takes a long time, uh, where you would want to correlate what has been the sale, let's say, between today and yesterday, today versus um, a day which is 30 days from today uh, in the past, etc. And Flink sits in between where it works on these unending sources of events and streams and gives you these insights using modern techniques, using Python uh, domain specific languages, DSLs, or even uh, regular SQL using Flink as SQL. And uh, I wanted to start and break down the stream processing and rename it as event stream processing, right? And the moment we talk about an event stream processing, the necessary question is what is an event? So uh, an event, in a very, very simple uh, language answer is something which has a notification and which has a state. Now, you could argue what could be a notification, what could be a state, but that's more of a design decision. But then a notification and a state along with the timestamp of when the event occurred, if possible to capture, is something which constitutes an event. 
Now, what are these events? What are the sources of these events? It could be sensors, right? It could be sensors within a manufacturing factory. It could be sensors within an EV manufacturing uh, 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 shop floor. It could be sensors within a renewable energy photovoltaic cell. It could be sensors within an electric volt battery. It could be a user interaction within a website. Somebody has a cart, somebody took some item out of the cart, removed something from the cart. It could be some microservices output. Let's say you have done uh, an upload of some document in a Aadhaar mobile app or something of that sort, right? Now, these are all events. And if you go back, these all would have a notification and a state associated with those events, right? What are there within the event? So within an event, you would at a minimum be able to find a key and a value. A key because we would want to categorize and group these events later on what kind of events it was. Let's say if it was a car checkout, it was a checkout event for an e-commerce uh, shop, right? If it was an IoT sensor event coming from, let's say, a, a vast, arid photovoltaic cell solar energy park in Gujarat, then maybe it's it's the device ID, which is the key. And the value is, let's say, the state of the charge. What is the state of the charge of that specific PV cell? Now, when we have these events, uh, remember I talked about an event stream. What happens is the events gets appended in that stream. And the stream is nothing but all these events sequenced together, right? Now, the difference between a, a batch, like a database table or a data warehouse table, the only difference with that and a stream is this is unbounded. There is no end to it, right? Because events continue getting appended and updated on this stream. So events ingested through an unbounded context is something as we call it as event stream. And these events are ingested perpetually until the event producer stops. And essentially what happens is whenever new data is there in the stream, new rows gets appended to the unbounded table. <clears throat> now, now that we understand what an event is, what an event stream is, let's understand what an event streaming platform or a more modern term is data streaming platform, DSP is, right? So a data streaming platform actually lets you work on these unbounded streams by putting some bounded context so let's say if i if i have an unbounded stream of stream of um, data coming from a solar energy park through iot sensors it would keep on getting added for uh, one minute one hour 24 hours and 30 days and 60 days and stuff like that right but then if we want to calculate and perform some operations on this stream what we put is a boundary, normally a temporal boundary. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, temporal boundary meaning a boundary with a start and an end of time. So let's say something uh, in, in business terms, it is something like what has been the number of checkouts from my retail section of the cars for the last 30 minutes. So this last 30 minutes creates the boundary between this actually perpetual un, un, unbounded stream. So all these contexts, the boundaries and the operational uh, parameters are done through this event streaming platform. So a platform where it lets you source data through events and then it lets you process data using an event streaming engine like Apache Flink and then lets you pass it on to a sync. Now a sync could be Another data streaming platform, a sync could be a completely terminal sync where it ends in something like an S3 or something like a database where it just gets stored, right? But then that is what a data streaming or an event streaming platform would normally do. Now, why Flink is chosen as one of the best streaming processors now in the market is because it is built grounds up uh, using this streaming uh, abstractions, all these streaming, uh, streaming techniques have been incorporated into uh, Flink, and it has not been made in a, fr in, a uh, in a way that it used to start with working on batch data, but then it has been retrofitted to do streams. It is started from grounds up as a uh, streaming data processor. 
and you have all these modern things that happens uh, with Spring. You can use DSLs, queries, you can have SQL statements, you can have aggregations and group buys and all these things you can do. So it's very developer friendly as well. <clears throat> so uh, before we jump into the inner working of Flink, again, just an overview of where we stand. So we have our sources, third party apps, custom apps or databases. It comes to a data streaming platform. So these together would constitute a data stream platform normally. So for here, what I've done is I've taken Apache Kafka as my storage layer where I would store the events. And I would use Flink as my compute, where I would run my SQL query, where I would run my Python DSLs, and then have a sync. Now, a sync could again be a Kafka storage, or it could be a database, a data warehouse, or it could be a SaaS app where I would just inform a third party URL, or let's say a SaaS URL like Salesforce that, yes, this sale is complete, or some status update to the Salesforce APIs, right? And then essentially you would have other systems, downstream systems, which would do the queries and visualization and analytics part of it. So this is the event streaming platform, right? Now, the again, coming back to that earlier story, uh, earlier image. So instead of uh, Flink, I just go one level deeper. So the real-time services are now being changed from their business counterparts to the system counterparts. So the source could be applications, um, IoT, uh, web application, microservices, et cetera, or it could be change log, change data capture, log streams coming from databases, or even files uh, getting uploaded in uh, a specific periodicity interval, or it could come from Kafka. I would have a real-time processing step, or as we call it as a direct acyclic graph, a DAG, uh, and then pass it on to my sinks, right? So, now, uh, if we dive a little deeper into a Flink cluster, so what happens is all these operations and jobs normally run in a Flink cluster. Um, earlier, it used to used to run on traditional Hadoop setups. Uh, Ten years back, it used to run on let's say a Cloudera or a Hortonworks distribution. But now, in, in modern data platforms, you can run all these things on um, cloud data platforms as well. So all most modern cloud service providers would have uh, Flink cluster readily available for you. And it follows the uh, regular um, YARN cluster architecture. So you would have the program, which as a developer I would write, and it would submit a Flink job. A Flink job could be, let's say, a Flink SQL, which I want to execute. And the job manager would decide that how many workers are there. And depending on uh, the workers, I would break my job into subtasks and then run it in something known as a task slot. Now, what is a task slot? A task slot is the individual thread that is running within that worker, right? So you could have a JVM process running in a worker, and then that JVM process could break into multiple threads, which could enable multiple slots to be uh, used. So for this, this example, if you look at the bottom diagram, what is happening is here, I'm running one, two, three, four, and five threads. What are these threads doing in a task? Two are doing uh, map operations, which is taking one value as an input, apply some transform on it, and then returning one value as an output. Taking that output, and I'm doing a group by or a key by or a window operation of some sort for both these, and then uh, inserting data back again in a sync. Right. So essentially, what goes on inside Flink is the task manager runs these task slots in separate threads, and the job manager assigns these task managers or these workers so that uh, you could actually have a job scale up and scale down based on this information of how much task is still remaining to work and all that. I don't want to go uh, down to the depth of how these things actually work because that would actually digress a little and go to a different uh, direction. But then please understand the, this is this is how these clusters work, right? Now, within this cluster, each of my SQL query, the Flink SQL that I would write on my events, let's say I want to do a group by on an event, or I want to do a count, or I want to do a sum of, let's say some of these, uh, how many card checkouts happened, or some of the battery charges which was consumed by a single device over a period of 30 minutes or something of that sort, essentially runs as a job. Right now, this job runs within a Flink cluster as a job graph. 
each job graph has operators which are like the actual functions which gets applied on the stream and connectors so this operator this operator is actually a sequential follower from this operator so this would go from here and from here right so this job graph gets uh, gets generated uh, which is mostly a dag and then gets run by uh, flink how does that run let me give you a small example right so we could have two parallel tasks which takes data from two source or let's say one source and then group by shape right so the first job would take only the square values square images the second value the second job would take only the the second task would take only the circular um, events so once these are grouped by shape it would forward it to the next operator right what the next operator would do is it would group by color so the yellow colored circular event would actually go here to the next operator and the cyan colored square uh, event would actually come here because i want to group by yellow color in this task and i want to group by cyan color in this task right so here i would have three square uh, yellow events and one circular yellow event and here i would end up with two circular cyan events and one um, square cyan event right so i'll do a group by color and then what we could do is we could run a rebalance operation what it would do is it would count the number of events within these two operators and then this operator if you query it would emit the result as okay i had four yellow events and i had three cyan events coming up or maybe some more information like what kind of events those were etc which you can get from the event itself so normally this is the flow every single flink job would follow whether i write a flink sql whether i write a python flink operation uh, on any event right let me take a pause here if you have any question before we jump into the apis i would like to take it so till now what we have done is we have just broken down the basic stream processing structure and dived a little bit deeper into how a flink cluster actually look like no questions okay <clears throat> this is arvin here yes so in this slide you are showing uh, operators as uh, circles right black circles right so each operator is running inside one uh, what do you call the thread task job is that that's right is? slot yes that's right so if i go back yeah so these are the operators a map a key by or a window and then a sync right so all these operators run in separate threads assigned by the task manager in a task slot but then you of course you can control but then most normally these are controlled by the task manager itself the task manager is intelligent enough to figure out these operations and then allocate threads uh, uh, for these subtasks and you showed the parallelism where in the previous slide two threads are two uh, operators are running in parallel that's right the top and bottom that's so right. i'm assuming uh, each uh, parallel stream is running in a separate uh, task manager that is, is that right correct? that is right absolutely so each each separate uh, job would run in a each separate parallel so while you do have a lot of configuration options for setting this parallelism up um, but modern flink releases you do not really need to bother about this so the parallel so the 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 flink job manager would uh, would be happy to decide the kind of parallelism it would require to uh, run these jobs but yes you're right so you can set the parallelism and you can run it parallel and then write it into a sync thank you yeah okay so now moving on so now that we understand a little bit of the flink cluster and how normally this flink uh, stream processing works thankfully we don't need to go into this level of detail when we write a program right that uh, how do i set the parallelism what is the task slot available on the j on the core of the worker machine and all those things right although if you want you can actually do it using an api called process function which is the lowest level stream processing api that flink offers 
but uh, as day has progressed flink moved into something known as a data stream which is a very verbose uh, but a higher level abstraction where you don't need to do low level stateful stream processing and it gives you many many higher level operators and then of course uh, the last couple of years saw the rise of flink sql and table api uh, which is like a declarative dsl so it becomes very very easy to work with uh, these events because these become a flink dynamic table uh, to me so uh, remember flink table api and flink sql uses the same api structure so it's just the the difference is just in how developers code so i code on python so i would write a table api dsl if you want you could write a flink sql sql as well and that sql string would generate the same explain plan when it gets broken down into the kind of operations uh, flink takes this operator to do okay so our today's focus is on table api and if we if you look at the level of abstraction uh, of course it starts from bottom and the higher you go up the abstraction also becomes higher because flink sql is nothing but sql so um, if you do it yourself if you want to run a self managed self hosted apache flink open source uh, then once you deploy this flink cluster on your uh, boxes on your linux boxes you could you would actually get a sql client where you could write write all your flink sequels or else what you could do is there are many um, managed serverless providers of, of flink like confluent and ivan and decodable and data rios etc who would provide you with a flink sql uh, editor id within the browser and you would be able to see all these events and then write the sql query get the result and then make it run perpetually etc and then uh, the auto scaling part of it like how many task workers i need and uh, if the load is high i would need to do an auto scale if the load is low i would need to come down to a one one worker scenario all these are taken care of but then long story short for a for a developer um, these table and sql api is something that we are going to talk about today and it's the highest level of abstraction today available with um, flink apache flink so what is the table api table api actually lets you create something known as a flink dynamic table what is a flink dynamic table um, a flink dynamic table is something which abstracts uh, an event stream right so remember I, I was talking about the unbounded context so what a dynamic table does is it creates a tabular sql like uh, syntax for that uh, stream uh, how does it look like so take this streaming example so my events are the username the timestamp and which link the user has clicked so marie has clicked dot home bob has clicked dot cart and then this gets written into the dynamic table perpetually okay. what does this dynamic uh, so so the dynamic table actually exists within the flink interface as a um, an, an abstraction which changes over time okay and then when you query a dynamic table what get, what you do generate is a continuous query now that could be a stateless or a stateful query so which means if you are doing an aggregation where you do a count or a sum which needs to get updated with every new records coming then you would rather want to do a state store right a fault tolerant state store so flink provides that um, it has adapters and plugins to uh, back it up into multiple different things like an s3 or an iceberg as well uh, but then long story short again querying a dynamic table would yield a continuous query and a continuous query would never terminate and produce a dynamic result which is again another dynamic table right that dynamic table can again be thought of as a stream so you could you could write a flink program where a dynamic table can be converted into a data stream and a data stream can be converted to a dynamic table. This uh, facility is available within Flink. Now let's let's go a little deeper into a dynamic table, right? So what is a dynamic table? Again, going back to the same uh, uh, example of user clicks on, uh, let's say, an e-commerce portal. So if I do, so this table is not generated until the, uh, the records start coming in. Now the record has started coming in, and now let's say I fire a query, select user and count of url as cnt from clicks table and i want to group by user so essentially what would happen is when the first row 
comes in, I would have a user Murray and account one, right? The second row comes in and then I have a user Murray one and Bob one. Third row comes in and I would have a update of Murray to two, right? Now it is easier said than done, but it is not a normal update and we will we'll understand why. Similarly with Liz, I would have a Mary 2, Bob 1 and Liz 1, right? Um, just the same thing if I break it down. So I, same thing, I've just done it in a step by step. Uh, but remember the most important thing is the third row, which yields an update of an already computed result. So Mary 1 became Mary 2. So Mary, of course, is the key, which remains the same, but the count became two. And then of course, the finally, the third query gets inserted. Now, once you understand this, uh, I would want to push it up a notch. And let's take another table where it is not an aggregation, but uh, a group by which is happening only on a bounded context of one hour, right? So essentially what would happen is the right hand side query would keep on appending the, uh, the results of this query every hour, for every hour. So for one o'clock, for two o'clock, for three o'clock, etc. right? And what have I done is I've used something known as a tumble window. Now windowing operation is a very common uh, stream processing technique and you find it in Apache Flink, you find it in Apache Beam, you find it in Apache Spark all popular stream processing frameworks would have it now the way it it actually breaks down is you have an user you have a time when the user did it and then um, the timestamp of the user operation and then the url which is the home right and what i'm doing is i'm doing a group by for this bounded context of bounded interval of one hour so within one hour, Mary clicked three times. That's why my count is three. Now, since Murray clicked on cart at two, see it is not here because that one interval, one hour interval, one to two is over, right? So it would actually appear within uh, two to three, correct? So similarly, uh, Bob and Liz and all this, so this is called a tumbling window and tumbling window the uh, the beauty of a tumbling window is the the intervals are non overlapping see there is a gap so th these are non overlapping but let's say if you want to do a cumulated average a moving simple moving average uh, of the user counts then you could use something known as a hopping window where the uh, where the interval context is let's say 1 hour but the window moves every let's say 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 20 minutes. So that's called a, called a hopping window. And then you have another third kind of window, which is called a session window, which actually creates boundaries against user idleness. Let's say the user did not do anything for one hour. And if I have a session window for one hour, the window would close. And then whatever happened within one hour would be emitted. Right? Now with an understanding of this, let's understand that there are three kinds of stream, uh, three kinds of tables. Uh, which Flink actually creates so that uh, we can apply our table API, right? So an append only stream, which is only inserts, a retract only stream, which is an add, delete, and update, which is the case for the for Murray because uh, for, for the second one, Murray one got updated to Murray two, so one got updated to two, uh, one got deleted, and then it got updated to two, right? An upset is nothing but uh, retract again, but then all happening in one single operation so it gives you some computational benefits uh, on top of it but by and large these three are the different tables that you would have in a stream to deal with right um now once we do all that a normal data flow would look like this so i would have a stream of events uh, event which might be transactions for here i would do some deduplicate here i would have another stream of customer it could be a static stream it could be a, a stream like transactions I might do a join and I might do a sync, right? So simply what you could do is you could do an insert into sync, select the ID, C name and T amount from customers, and then join select distinct star from customers on C ID and T of T uh, underscore customer ID. So the transaction customer ID and the customer customer ID gets joined. I do a distinct so that the deduplicated, so the transaction tables gets deduplicated, and then I do an uh, inner join 
with the transaction and customers and then put the result into a sync. A sync could be a Kafka topic, a sync could be S3, sync could be an elastic search index, a sync could be an open table format like Iceberg where I would just drop my table for something else to pick up, etc. Right? So, uh, so this basically is what uh, what table API, right? Now, uh, how do I write programs around that? So, again, what we do is uh, so this is I've, I've copied it from my GitHub repo. So, uh, I have a series of uh, blogs written on Flink and Kafka getting started. So, this is one of the examples actually. So. But then uh, you forget about the syntax. The syntax is simple. So you create a, uh, an extent, so an entry point for a stream processing application for Flink by using this ENV, which is a stream execution environment. Then you create some environment settings. Um, the settings could be, you could actually process it in streaming mode. You could process it in batch mode as well. Stream uh, Flink provides you both batch and stream processing and unified uh, way. And then you create uh, the table environment, add the Flink SQL jar, and then, I'm sorry, and then write this uh, sensor readings table. So what I've done is I have a Kafka topic called sensor readings, which has a device ID, carbon monoxide count, humidity, motion gyro, um, which way, whether it is moving or not a Boolean, temperature, ampere hour, how much battery charge is consumed by the device, and then the processing time and the event time, right? So you could see what you all you got to do is just put your Kafka uh, credence, uh, Kafka uh, information here. So this width, width section creates the dynamic top table. So for this one, I have created Kafka as my source. I could have done it on a file source as well as a simple file source. It could have been a batch. So I have a topic sensor readings, uh, which is of course running here. And then, um, then what I do is I execute the SQL. And once the SQL gets executed, the Flink catalog gets populated with this table sensor underscore readings. And I just um, create a table reference by uh, getting the registered table from the catalog. Once that is done, now this is the meat of this whole thing, the tumbling window that I was showing up. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm creating a tumbling window for a 30 second window, which is created on my sensor readings table. Where I'm creating the window on, I'm creating the window on the processing time. So if you go back, you have this proc time processing time, which is the time when this event has arrived to the Flink processor. And it is automatic. You don't need to provide that time. This time is captured by Flink. And then I do a group by on my device ID. And then I select the device ID and I do a sum for the battery charge. So for every 30 seconds, it would show me the three devices that I have, how much comp total charge it is getting consumed, right? And let's say if I, uh, if my event enter ingestion velocity is every five seconds, then what would happen is there would be six readings per device within that uh, uh, 30 second window. And this would do a sum for the charge consumed by looking at this uh, ampere hour uh, column of the table or actually part of the event as well, whichever way you look at it and do a sum on it. And then what I do is I create a device charge sync where I have a device ID, I have a charge consume. Window start and window end is something which I just wanted to uh, do for verbose purpose so that we could have a look. But then I could have the device ID and the charge consumed uh, given in this topic. This is again a Kafka topic. So I could decide to write it on an elastic search on an S3 or, or maybe a database as well even. And then what I do is I do an execute insert, which is nothing but an insert into uh, from this table into that table. Uh, could you have written the entire thing with uh, without using table API, but using Flink SQL? Absolutely, yes. So in that case, the, the DSL would, would have transformed into something like this. Select device ID, tumble start, tumble end, some ampere hour as charge consumed from the sensor readings table and group by uh, device ID. And then the rest of the thing is similar. Okay. So what you could have also done is uh, you could actually look at your explain plan 
for the flink table api and uh, what you could do is you could run an explain sql on the uh, on the query this query and then what would happen is uh, it would give you this this kind of a i mean this is very normal if you're doing doing it for for long you know it would give you the st how the query optimizer is working and the actual execution plan right and you could um, you could actually decide whether i want to do a full table source scan or whether i want to do a broadcast hash and all those different things which would come into being but then uh, normally you would you would go through this so that you understand what exactly is going on <clears throat> so let's do a quick recap uh, before we jump into a demo so why use a stream processor because we want to have a, a good customer experience and real time backend operation possible for every event um why flink table api and flink sql because we you can use sql for stream processing uh, which we showed earlier why uh, stateful stream processing because flink gives you all the operator privileges that you could do and it all runs in a dag so easy to look up and easy to control you could actually see all these happening on the uh, on some of the stream lineage uh, ui if if the if um, if a flink managed service provider is showing you uh, flink does have local state with remote backup capability so if some of the jobs fail it does a checkpointing and then all the state is stored locally uh, you could actually store your state into something as remote as s3 and then when the when the next job starts or let's say the faulty thread uh, starts again it can read from the checkpoint and start from exactly the same moment and then you could do a snake snap snapshot for fault tolerance so uh, you could have the entire uh, processing run from a different set of pods and kubernetes operators by moving this entire state store and uh, you could do all that right and then flink also has something known as watermarks uh, so remember the tumbling window intervals there would be situation uh, in real life where events would come out of order um, which actually means between um, 155 and 145 all these two o'clock events got pushed which is an anomaly but then flink actually has watermarks you could define watermark strategy so that this is not counted within your tumbling window what else flink can do you can do sql joins uh, it has native capabilities of taking care of cdcs you can do pattern matching with match recognized it is very very important for fraud for fraud analytics practices um, etc right where is the flink community this is the flink community flink.apache.org.community there is a very very active slack um, so lot of questions on pyflink and flink sql as well as flink data stream uh, i encourage you to join the slack and uh, i i mean there are so many fantastic people who answer these questions i'm also part of it and uh, that's it so uh, thank you very much uh, i would um, i would like to uh, have questions and answers uh, from you but then before that please uh, note these two things we have kafka summit coming up in bangalore on 2nd of may you could use a promo code and you will get a 50 percent discount on the registration fee it's happening at sheraton whitefield uh, it's a one day affair where there would be a lot of talks given by uh, both Indian and international uh, attendees, speakers who are coming over. And then there are uh, Bangalore Flink meetup as well, where you could join and you could have a uh, uh, little chit chat. But then while you have the question, uh, you get ready for the question. I wanted to show you the demo. <clears throat> so please talk to me when you have a question. So this is my uh, Kafka craft here app server. And uh, what I would do is I would just quickly start this server. Yes, server started fine. Let me check. Uh, yep, node ID one. And yeah, local is 1992. So my craft is ready. Let me create uh, two topics. So. I'll create a topic sensor readings, of course. So my sensor reading topic got created. And then I would create a uh, Kafka topic, device.charge. 
let's create this topic. I hope the demo works as well, but yeah. Now let's go to my Flink console. So I have a <clears throat> simple Kafka producer where I create this uh, sensor event uh, data, uh, where I have the device ID and CO and humidity. So what I do is I've created a config where I have my bootstrap server, my client ID, etc., And then um, I just run a continuous loop where it pushes this data into the sensor.readings Kafka topic. Let's run it. It has started. Good. Next, go. Let's go to my Flink uh, uh, operations, and this code I already shown you. Um, and then what I did was I created a sensor underscore readings table, which is a dynamic table on the Kafka topic sensor dot readings. And then um, I extracted the table reference from the Flink catalog. I applied the tumbling window for every 30 seconds bounded context imposed on the proc time. I did a group by with uh, device ID and I did a sum for the ampere hour because I wanted to know the charge consumed by this table, uh, by these uh, devices. Then I created a sync table, which is again on a Kafka topic, device.charge, and I wrote the device ID and the charge consumed table. And then I uh, just ran this uh, job, right? And this job would run perpetually until the, either the producer stops or uh, I manually stop this job, right? <clears throat> so now what it is doing, it is, it is applying this transform and then copying it into the sync. So again, let's go back to the consumer now and see how so device charge. Let's run and fingers crossed. Let's hope it works. Uh, it has started emitting some results. So <clears throat> I'm already getting results from my sync table. Let's just get another batch. So it is happening every 30 seconds, right? So it is doing a rolling uh, group by every 30 seconds for uh, these three devices. So if you just copy this. So actually copy both so that we could compare the time as well. And let's put it here. I hope you can see it. So now you see these three are the device IDs. I started my window at 750 and the window ends at uh, 750.00 and the window ended at 750, 30 seconds. So for this 30 second window, for this device, the sum of those ampere HR, that ampere hour value was 2.53. Now this could be important for understanding what is your SOC, uh, sorry, what is your state of charge, etc., for your devices. But it's a contrived example in any case. Then after 7:30, since it was a tumbling window, it again created another batch, uh, another bounded context for 7:50:30 to 7:51. And then again, it computed the charges. Don't worry about the not rounding off. So I haven't played around with the rounding off. You could actually round it off too. So, but then this would go on, right? So this would go on and you would keep on getting every 30 seconds. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, two, and then two. So we have four 30 seconds elapsed and uh, it is showing us uh, this data. So thankful to the demo gods that the demo worked. Um, so yeah, so that's it uh, from my side. If you have any questions, happy to take those. Um, if you have, if you don't have a question, if you have any uh, any plans to learn Flink and slash or Kafka and and get into data streaming, we could discuss that as well. Um, so I have come from I've come from AWS and Google, where data streaming as and modern data platform both has a uh, a lot of traction going on and then now i joined conference so i now focus specifically on data stream yeah sorry somebody was asking a question i'm sorry uh, yeah go ahead, uh, so i have a doubt yes yeah. so i have a doubt like uh is state management is uh is for both the stream layer and the batch layer so see for batch layer you do not really need to worry much about the state right because 
for every so because essentially batch is an is a bounded context so i would have a table or i would have a set of data so it might have 10 records it might have 100 records it might have 100 million records and if i write my group by it would immediately return the group by results to me correct so i do not really need to worry about states but that is not the case for um, streaming group buys because streaming group buys are bounded by these intervals, right? Now, essentially what is going to happen is if you keep a table which is an aggregate for each, so take this example, if you keep a table which is the aggregate for each device, that would keep on changing, correct? So unless you store the state of that uh, dynamic table sync, which is a sync and materialize it, so, I mean, I don't, I did not want to really use the term materialize, but then this is almost like a materialized view and uh, mm -hmm. Flink would take care of the state for that. But for batches, you don't need to do that. So if you go to the, the my GitHub repo and, and my blog, I have actually done a fair bit of analysis with a batch file as well. And you don't need mm -hmm. to worry about the state, but the fantastic thing is the code remains absolutely the same. So Flink has a unified batch and stream processing um uh framework so from a framework perspective it's absolutely the same okay. hey Deepthi, uh it's a great session um so i have this one question right like uh, sure. uh so apache fling you know it's a uh, backed by uh rux tv even i guess you know of costumes are uh, you know backed by rags to be just i was wondering you know like how these two uh, systems are leveraging rocks tv so can you give uh... <clears throat> yeah yes absolutely so uh, let, let, let's come to flink first so if you go to flink and if you try to tinker with or play around with how to choose your frame uh, state store pretty much you would see that unlike Kafka streams, Flink does not uh, have a very vivid and detailed, explicit Rocks DB interfaces around, right? Definitely, it stores on in Rocks DB. But then, what we are also seeing is if you are if you if you if you're seeing the activity in the Flink uh, 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 pool, uh, the flips, the new flips, Flink improvement plans, which are coming up in GitHub you would see that uh, there is a conscious effort with Flink to sort of abstract out this whole state management, right? Because today it is rocks DB. Tomorrow, if we have a capability that my state is maintained in, you know, something else, uh, tomorrow, let's say uh, S3 becomes so fast that uh, it is faster than, let's say, an SSD, then there's no reason why it should not be done on S3, right? But in Kafka streams, it's not like that. Kafka streams is designed to use RocksDB at its test, as its uh, state store. Um, and of course, Kafka streams can only work with Kafka topics, right? So you don't have the privilege. So today my sync was on a Kafka topic, uh, the example that I showed you. But then it could have been very well be a iceberg table as well. So I could have just written the same thing on an iceberg table or a or elastic search. So actually, if you go and uh, let's say let me show you. So there is this section called uh, connectors. And if you go to table API and connectors, look at the sync that is possible. So you could have file system, open source, open search, ES, uh, all these different things could be a sync, right? And it, it all supports HMS. So you have an Hive Metastore support as well. So you could easily dump all those things. So that's the basic difference. But then today, if, if you look at it, and if you're running it with Confluent, uh, if at all, then there is no difference, to be honest. The only thing is it is completely abstracted out so that uh, you focus only on the development bit and the state management, fault tolerance, state uh, snapshotting, et cetera, is done by the platform. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, got it. I have one very basic question, maybe sure. you can say silly question. Like, yeah, Apache Flink will be used for real-time computation. So it right. will take data from the, you know, Kafka topics and it will do processing and the downstream services will consume. But right. what if, if if I have one more worker, right? I mean, say some Java backend app, which will listen to, you know, Kafka uh, messages and do computation. So what is the difference here? I mean, like between Flink and the... So, some... yeah. So what would... So what 
what would be your problem let's say, let's understand what would be your problem let's say if you're not using flink let's say you're doing it uh, you're doing it using kafka streams i mean that would be the simplest example right um yeah. if you're doing it in a kafka stream kafka stream has a different design philosophy because it lets you do build a fat jar it becomes part of your application layer right but flink actually gives you much much i mean a, a, a higher level design capability beyond that as well because it gives you the whole data streaming platform so simple question for you if you have a kafka topic today and let's say to, today you're dumping this data into a, a postgres sql database or an oracle database right now tomorrow your business expands and tomorrow with kafka you have let's say a kinesis or a mongo as your um, as one of the sources and they ask you that we have we want to share, we want to use adls gen v2 as my sync now then you would be stuck with let's say even if your java if you're using a java application the problem is you'll have to build all these source adapters your uh, like you have to code all those things right it, these will not come uh, as uh, ready made things but for flink these are all there i mean if you open file system you would see there is an interface called uh, there is an interface called source where you could actually have all these different kind of sources you could actually build these different sources and it supports all these modern popular format of files as well so you have canal json you have orc avro parquet uh, csv and all these different sorts i think that is the reason why flink scores higher in terms of not having a single let's say a custom built bespoke java application which might work for your current use case and if you are and if it is working fine you actually should not uh, should not throw it out away but then uh, your business might expand and you might have a different source and a sync tomorrow so uh, so that's number one and and the second thing is the infrastructure right i mean today if your java program stops what do you do you'll have to restart your java program right if your java program restarts then you'll have to read it from your state store now i'm not sure how much you have delved into rocks db believe me i've done it it's not an easy task uh, your rocks db might get corrupted as well right so your rocks db folder it gets corrupted then what do you do how do you ensure that you uh, you can get all your states to so these are normal stream processing challenges which is not new like i mean these stream processing challenges were there for the last 20 years but then uh, since flink has been built grounds up to handle all this it gives you a very solid um, abstraction to handle all those these all those things but then again i mean running your uh, own flink inf infrastructure is not easy as well that's why i also see people tending toward uh, people tend towards managed infrastructure of flink where i don't worry about anything else i just write my sql or i just pass my uh, table api construct and i get my sync um, and today those that, that's a reality so you have these beautiful platforms which offer you uh, all this and that question was from oh i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry i did not look yes. at it was it tiru tiru malesh tiru yeah 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 tiru yeah i hope you got the gist of it but yeah it's a it's it's not a binary yes or no question but then it all depends on the kind of use cases you're doing but then these are the reasons why flink is becoming uh, the weapon of choice sure Is, uh, yeah, this is Arvind. Uh, I have one question. You spoke quite a bit about the table API, and then uh, you showed the exam. Same thing can be done with Flink, Flink SQL. So Correct. since so, I come from SQL background, I am familiar with SQL syntax. Wouldn't okay. that be the more obvious choice for me? <laughs> or, or is there a reason to go for table API? No, 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 no. So I, I just love the Python DSL. So I, I code in Python DSL a lot. Um, it's it's just a personal preference i believe but uh, i showed you somewhere no so yeah so this is the slide if you remember i showed you right a flink dynamic table now flink sql and flink python flink table api both are the same extraction so the apis are the same so whether you are whether you are writing uh, where did the slide go whether you are writing this in python let me show it on a slideshow 
whether you're writing this in a Python or whether you're, or the, or whether you're writing this in a SQL, if you just type us uh, and explain. So here, if you do a tumbling window dot explain, or here you do a tumbling window dot SQL dot explain, you would get the same output. This would be the same for both because they are API uh, uh, at the API level. They are all the same. So it is just a wrapper. So if you're if you come from a SQL background, absolutely you should try out uh, Flink SQL. Um, but then I love this uh, this syntax. I've done a lot of this like seven years, six seven years back with Spark RDD and Spark Data Frame. So uh, I, I, I I sort of developed a liking around this. Um, but then of course I mean this and this are absolutely similar when the query optimizer sees it. So it doesn't really matter. Um, the performance remains absolutely the same because they are API equivalent. Okay. So there's no limitation of Flink SQL. Like no. uh, everything that the table API can do, Flink SQL can also do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So everything okay. a table API can do, you can write it in Flink SQL. It generates the same explain plan. So you, you understand there is nothing, nothing else there. And uh, both support so as i told you these are api comp api equivalent so if there is a tumbling window support in flink sql it has to be in the pipeline table api if there is a, a high watermark strategy in uh, flink uh, pipeline table api it has to be within uh, sql as well so, so these are api compliant thank you yeah. any other questions from others in the audience Actually, I was uh, so I I was I was trying to commit another change in the documentation trunk, but then that did, did not go through. But uh, there is a section where we have this uh, written in bold words that these two are are API oh, okay, compliant. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like, I I just. By the way, I I should also tell you a little bit of history of Flink. So Flink got open sourced in 2011 or 2014. Those days it used to be called Project Stratosphere. Uh, here, here. So if you if you can read, if you can see, Apache Flink features two relational APIs, the table API and SQL, uh, for unified processing. Um, blah blah blah, and specify the same result regardless of the user. Uh, integrate seamlessly with each other. So yeah, there's no yeah. difference between these two. These are API compliant. But yeah, so so it got uh, so Project Stratosphere got incubated, and then I think it was accepted as an Apache project in 2014. Uh, famous people, Robert Metzger, um, Martin, Fisher, Constantine, now they had contributed a lot. Uh, Fling used to be bundled with Cloudera kind of uh, distribution. So CDP, CDR, HDP would normally have Fling uh, within it. But then um, it used to run all, all on data stream, which was like those old day RDDs. Uh, and then once table API and SQL became mainstream and uh, got added as a feature, I think in 2018 or 19, if I'm not sure, uh, then Flink SQL and table API got uh, started accepted very, very well. A lot of work has been done by Alibaba Cloud, especially. So if you see the commits, old commits, like four or five years, I think more than 50, 60% were done by Alibaba. And then it got uh, took up. So now there are more than I think 15, 20, 25 companies which are contributing into the Apache Flink uh, trunk. Very, very active. You can check it up. The pull, uh, the the commit frequency and the PR velocity is is unthinkably high. So very, very active project. And then now you have all these. So this is all the open source version, right? So you can host it and run it. But then you have these companies, big companies, which are opening up and giving you a completely managed, scaled version of it, right? So you don't worry, need to worry about your job manager, task manager. They would scale up and down. You don't worry about your state, checkpointing, safe pointing, etc. Um, so Confluent has a Confluent fling. Decodable has a managed fling. Ivan IO has a managed fling. Data Rios has a managed fling. So, uh, so yeah, so this has become completely mainstream now. But yeah, if you're if you're still, I mean, you want to give back to the community, which I always request you to, uh, please join the community. Please take uh, join the Slack channel. 
see if you could answer join stack overflow and see if you could answer i mean uh, once you learn because uh, otherwise the communities cannot survive it, it's all up to us um, so so we need to show some love towards the community as well similar to similar to kafka so that's why i i just thought i would give you this here um, the kafka summit is in bangalore if you're in bangalore on may 2 and if your company allows you to reimburse maybe i don't know i i don't recall how, it, how what exactly was the price i think it was 2200 rupees after um, applying the promo code please do come and and talk and hear this these beautiful uh, curated speakers out there would be flink and kafka sessions is what i heard ganesh you have a question go ahead but it's not directly related to this topic if you uh, okay then uh, i will ask my question first uh, Okay, uh, Kafka streaming, what is the future uh, now that you have mentioned that, you know, the use cases where Flink is more powerful, hmm. what is the future of Kafka streaming? So Kafka stream is, has a very, very bright future. It has a community of its own. It is an open source project. Confluent is the biggest committer. And then there are other thousands of other committers as well. Uh, we intend to have Kafka. We intend to support Kafka streams in both Confluent Cloud and Confluent Platform as well. And it remains um, the best Kafka compliant um, Kafka ecosystem data streaming engine. But then please remember and understand the two different scenarios for this. You can't create a Flink uh, fat jar which you can stick it into your micro uh, Spring Boot distribution. But then you can do it, do that with Kafka streams, right? So if you have a web application or a, a CQRS kind of an application where you have some commands and queries and all that's happening, and Kafka is used as one of the uh, event streaming platforms, Kafka streams is your number one choice. Flink will not work there. But then if it is data and high velocity of data, high volume of data, which you're doing, and your merging with let's say iceberg etc then flink becomes your weapon of choice because it comes with all these adapters written and the reason is you 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 would you can you it's a ready-made service to run uh, flink sql etc so i don't think one competes with the other but the use cases are very very uh, well defined for both flink is very very good for event stream uh, for data streaming platforms kafka stream is very very good for uh, creating an application library which you can stick it within your mainstream web applications to do um, uh, to take and read from topics um, formations and then you know write into uh, let's say another application or make it available for another application in a data mesh topic so those are the use cases for kafka streams but then coming back to your point uh, absolutely 100% supported by all committers in uh, in in apache and all these big companies like uh, confluent and ivan and um, red panda etc it's there to stay it's not going away absolutely no way i hope you answered your question arvin and then somebody else was asking a question. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for this session, uh, Deepthi Man. Uh, I'm a beginner as far as data streaming is concerned. So I sure. found this session very useful uh, at an introductory level. So it Absolutely. was a good introduction to uh, Apache Flink. I'm, I'm very and happy that's... for you to, uh, to let, me, uh, let me speak. For Devopedia, very glad that it all worked out. Um, I travel to Bangalore very frequently, so uh, if you have any more talks, I'm I'm comfortable giving talks on both Flink, Kafka streams, and Kafka. If you sure. have, uh, if there are interested audiences, absolutely, I would I would love to do so. But I mean, thanks again for. I mean, I know it's it's a Friday night. I it, I'm I'm so glad that you guys could make it and.